You talked about the drawings that you would do on the blackboard in the back, and in particular the ones that popped Andre the Giant. And I wonder if you wouldn't mind telling London what kind of things you would draw on that blackboard. Wow. <laughs> There's... I would draw everything that didn't really happen. You know, if somebody, um, you know, if somebody was with an ugly girl in the bar talking to her or anything, it was like the next day it would be like a full blown orgy on the blackboard and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, anything that, you know, to be honest, it was, it was to make everyone laugh. And, uh, um, I think what, one of my favorite cartoons was, um, well, I'll, I'll try to describe the orgy itself. <laughs> I would always draw this big tree, like a big giant tree, and, and all the wrestlers would be trying to climb up the tree. And while they were climbing up the tree, there'd be this orgy happening. And uh, a lot, none of it was based on anything real at all. I mean, in fact, uh, I used my my centerpiece in my cartoons was always Chief J. Strongbow. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he was one of the um, the agents or the foremans for the wrestlers, and he was always a, a a really devoted family man and all that stuff. But he was always in the middle of the orgy with, uh, <laughs> and and he would come in and shake his head, and and he didn't know who was doing it for a long time. Because I would draw these drawings in the blackboard because sometimes in the dressing room, there's like five or six different dressing rooms and two or three guys in one dressing room, one guy's in another, and like 20 guys are in the other one. It just depends on where you walk in when you set your bag down. And so often I was just sitting in the dressing room and nobody was around. I just draw these huge, I had nothing else to do to my, especially when you got done in your shower, it's like you got all night sitting there waiting for somebody to finish. So you just keep drawing these, this orgy. <laughs> And I didn't realize it, but Andre the Giant loved my drawings. He he didn't. I don't think he. I don't think Andre even knew it was me drawing them for a long time. But I would draw them, and they were like a mysterious artist running around in the dressing room that's drawing all these things. And I remember guys. Some guys would flip out and get mad, and some guys would. Some most of the guys would laugh their heads off, but nobody really knew. I remember. I don't know if you remember George Wells. He was a football player that was in WWE that was a great guy that he would come in and laugh so hard, but he would always try to touch up and change little things and write little bubbles in the cartoons and stuff. And I remember they, people will come in and they I remember that chief Jay Starrow with his hands on his hips, watching him touch up one of my cartoons. And he, I remember he turned around and goes, it's, I swear to God, it's not me drawing these, but he, he, they thought it was him for a long time until I had to kind of come forward. Cause I thought I better get credit for these drawings to the <laughs> They're getting too popular, but uh, but Andre would really love my drawings. He he, honestly, I, I, it's hard to describe how. F Sometimes it's like Brett just finished a drawing, and Andre would kick his chair out and like almost run run to the room to look, and then he would just laugh and laugh so hard. And it was actually very heartwarming for me to make Andre laugh that hard because uh, and they a lot of my cartoons were. You know, overly graphic and stuff like that. Uh, what was I the think, What was the King Kong Bundy one? The King Kong Bundy one was one of my favorites. Um, I drew King Kong Bundy. It was his last day. I remember Survivor Series. It might have been the very first Survivor Series we ever did, and I think Bundy was in it. And um, I just remember I drew Bundy on his hands and knees, <laughs> throwing up, and he was throwing up a big giant pile of penises. <laughs> I made a, there was like a, a big pile of them and he was just like, ah, you know, and they were all just coming out. And I remember everyone laughed. It got such a good laugh. It was like one of my favorite cartoons. And I just remember Bundy came in and he laughed and he, by then he knew it was me doing the cartoons and I did. It always made me laugh because he wrote every one of my brother's names. I don't know how he knew all my brother's names, but he wrote all my brother's names on each penis. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, yeah, there was a lot of them. I always had Virgil hanging himself. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and Virgil loved that. He'd like somehow be hanging from the tree from his own penis. <laughs> 
And it was just stuff like that. But it was always, uh, most guys loved it. You know, uh, poor Steve Lombardi, I always drew him, uh, you know, doing some horrible things in these cartoons. And he, he, you know, it was always like, I remember one time he goes, he goes, you know, I'm not gay. You know, I'm not, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not like that. And like, he draw all that stuff on there. It was like, it, it was starting to really kind of get to him. And I remember I told him, I said, Steve, I said, none of this is based on anything real. It's all I'm just, I said, the next time I draw a cartoon of you and you're, you know, doing something really bad in the cartoon, I don't want you to think about what the cartoon, I said, just look over at Andre. And if you don't see Andre laughing his head off, then I'll stop drawing you. And I remember he came back and he told me, he said, you draw me anytime you want. Because <laughs> Andre would literally like fall off his chair laughing so hard. And uh, I did draw one time, I drew, um, one of my foremans, I won't say which one, there was a story that came circulated back. I, like I say, these stories are probably not even true, but some story circulated about him and a, and a, and a woman. And uh, I, I drew some on the blackboard. I remember he was basically throwing her off a cliff. Um, anyway, I remember I had the cartoons that's somewhere in the Rockies. And, uh, but I drew it in, in, uh, on the blackboard and he just wigged out. He totally lost. He got so mad. And he was almost like shrieking at me, like, don't you ever draw me on a blackboard again? You know, what if my wife saw that and all this? And I was like, what's your wife going to be doing walking in the dressing room? Like, it's never going to happen. Anyway, he really chewed my ear off. And I remember thinking, oh, boy, I'm in a lot of trouble for this. And uh, it was the very next day. I, I remember walking into the TV taping. And uh, you got to be there at noon. So I was walking in about noon 12 o'clock and i just see vince with his arms crossed and he's by the blackboard drawing he's he's holding a big piece of chalk <laughs> and i remember walking in and he goes and hands me the chalk and he's got this smirk on his face he goes you draw anything you want anytime you want and if anyone's got a problem with it you tell them to see me <laughs> and i was like he said and he told me he says it's, it's good for morale he goes, it cheers everybody up and makes everyone laugh their head off and, and you don't have any, pro don't let anyone stop you from doing it. So I always drew cartoons. In fact, most of my career, people were always like wanting to get on the blackboard. I remember like when I find the, I remember Undertaker finally, he, he, he never made the blackboard. Not yet anyway at that time when I first knew him. And I remember he bought a Harley Davidson and he was talking about it for months that he had this new, Harley Davidson that he bought that was brand new and he was, they were shipping it to his house. And the day, I remember him talking about going home the day he was going to ride it. And it was brand new. First day he got it, he took it out and he crashed it. <laughs> he, he hit gravel or something like that. And he, was, he luckily didn't get hurt or anything, but he totaled his bike or something like that. And I remember I drew it on the blackboard and I had him dry, riding a tricycle. <laughs> and it was just a silly cartoon, but it was like the first time I ever drew uh, Undertaker. And uh, it was like a big thing. A lot of guys, a lot of guys didn't like being drawn. And when you drew them, they weren't flattered by how you drew them because you, if they were pot belly, they were even worse than that in the cartoon. And um, I remember Warrior one time. There was a story that came out. It was on the. It was in one of those tabloid magazines about him. Um, doing massages or something with gay men, or I don't know, I don't even know if it was true, but it was a big expose on Warrior. This is probably when he was in the height of his, like probably 87, 88, 89, somewhere in there. And I remember he, it was very embarrassed by the, it was like, um, it was in this tabloid magazine or, or newspaper kind of thing. And uh, it was fun, one of those things where everyone was kind of tiptoeing around it. And I remember I drew the whole thing with the uh, warrior on the bearskin rug with uh, some guy rubbing. <laughs> and, and I knew it was like, okay, this is going to really, unfortunately, it's going to really make warrior really mad. But you know, the truth is, is that a warrior was so embarrassed by the story, true or false. I don't know if it was ever true I and mean, who can believe those kind of news tabloid things. And I just remember Warrior came in the dressing room and all the wrestlers were laughing their heads off. And then Warrior came in the room and he saw it. And he laughed so hard that it broke the ice on the whole thing and it was like never brought up again. And I thought, you know, that's the way to do it. It's like, 
throw it right in everyone's face and get it over with. So it's like everyone had a good laugh. I remember Warrior going, it's the first time he made the blackboard and all that stuff. Some of you may get this and some of you may not. If you don't get this question, Google it. Adam wants to know. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> it's been 25 years. Have you figured out how to say goodbye yet? Uh, apparently not. <laughs> I'm still here. You know, um... Does anybody remember WrestleMania, the album? Yeah. No? Wow. Not that many people. Um, but Bret Hart had a single on that album. Four on the UK charts, you know. <laughs> Simon Cowell produced, produced that. So you do this song on WrestleMania, the album, never, never the Right Time to Say Goodbye. YouTube it is. It's something. Um, <laughs> what, what happened? Well, when you, you know, I had just become champion. I think I've been champion about 10 days when they told me, like, yeah, you're flying to England and you're going to sing a song on the album. And it's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> but, you know, it's like, I remember kind of being like, handed the torch for the company. And it's like, I'll do whatever I can. I mean, whatever they threw at me, I was going to try to do it, everything. Every, anything they asked me to do. And uh, when they gave me the lyrics to that song, it's never the right time to say goodbye. I remember, I remember, like, first of all, I can't sing. I know I can't sing. I don't need to kid myself that I can. I have a very deep uh, monotone voice. And, uh, no. and so I remember I flew to London got off the plane and they picked us up at the airport and I had it, I got like um, taken by myself away from all the other wrestlers to a studio, literally as soon as I landed and told to sing this song. And I told uh, that Simon Cowell, whatever I told, I told him, I said, I can't sing. Trust me, I can't sing any of this. Um, I said, let's do it like Telly Savalas, like the, um, he had some spread song about, uh, I can't remember what it was called, but it was some old song. But it, I remember he talked through the song. And I remember going, let me do it like that. Like, I'll just talk. And he said, no, no, you know, we can do stuff with, we can, we can, we can tweak it and make, make your voice sound really good. And I'm like, no, you can't. <laughs> and he said, just, just try. Just sing, just sing for me one time. And so I sang the song for him. And I swear I belted out. I sang him the best song I could. I sang the whole song. And at the very end of it, he said, okay, we'll do it your way. <laughs> and that's the song. What are your last words for London? Um, I just always thought England was, um, had my best fans ever. You know, you were, um, I, I always understood it about England, you know, because I wrestled here in 1981 when I was just Bret Hart. Actually, I was Cowboy Bret Hart, which is like funny. <laughs> I came all the way over to England. I had a vest and a cowboy hat, and that was my gimmick. And uh, cowboy Bret Hart. And I remember, I remember one night I'd be a bad guy, and the next night I was like, "Oh, you're a good guy tonight." I was like, "Okay, I'll be a good guy." And uh, I, remember I tagged up with Big Daddy a couple of times. I wrestled guys like Pat Roach in the Royal Albert Hall. I wrestled uh, a Dynamite Kid in Warrington, in his hometown. Um, wrestled Marty Jones on the final show at Bellevue. I was only here for a couple of months, but they were, <clears throat> I know one thing that it, British wrestling fans always had a real history in wrestling. They, they, they were a big part of where wrestling is today and the fans were real and they, they, they loved their wrestling over here. And I knew kind of in 1981, like when I was here, how much I had so much fun. It was only one of the only territories I ever worked. Uh, where I had so much fun. I remember Max Crabtree, who was, um, uh, I don't know if he's even with us still anymore, but Max Crabtree was the brains of wrestling and uh, British wrestling. And he was such a genius. If you ever got to know him, or I don't know why anyone never talks to him or reaches out to him, but he was he was every bit the Vince McMahon before Vince McMahon. He was such a, he'd run th four or five shows across England every night in little theater halls and little buildings. And they had a real, he had a real um, great imagination for putting great wrestling together. And when I came here in, uh, I don't know when the first time I was here, but I'm guessing maybe 86 or 87, 
you know, you could tell that the fans were becoming um, sort of educated to American style wrestling with, without the boxing style rules with the 10 counts all the time. And I knew, I said, wrestling's going to kick the doors open in England. It's going to be totally different, but the fans are going to love it because it's going to be the real, really good wrestling that Americans have sort of cultivated over the last 50 or 60 years. I mean, I think if you look back to like 1920 or 1930 when wrestling was starting to evolve, it was all wrestlers that were shooters, just like UFC, that were guys that were in pro wrestling and they kind of got tired of hurting each other for real. And they said, why don't we start you know, let's, I'll let you win this time and I'll win next time. Or let's, I'll come back the next turn, next month and we'll wrestle in a rematch and try to draw money and make, make it like a business. But that was such a great idea. And uh, that's where wrestling is today. I mean, I look at UFC and I have so much respect for all those guys that break each other's arms and punch each other in the face as hard as they can. And you all got the cauliflower eels like my dad used to have and all that. I certainly have respect for all that, but uh, I got more respect for myself knowing that I go in the ring and I pretend to do that. I think that's, uh, <clears throat> that's the performance art. And...